My name is Jason Scott. Um, I am a documentary filmmaker, a computer historian. I am currently the free range archivist at the Internet Archive in California, which is the Wayback Machine to many people. And I'm also a public speaker. Uh, I have some sort of mutant gene, which means I really like doing incredibly involved nerdy things, but I'm also incredibly comfortable in front of crowds. So that's like in the worlds that I run, that's like having a knife in spoon town. It is an incredible ability. And what I try to do there is speak for people who I feel wouldn't normally be comfortable sharing their stories and passing along all of the things I observe and I see. So that's kind of where I move from and how I've always gone about things thematically. So when I was asked to speak at this event, uh, it was a matter of what's it about? And I said that it was a dinosaur among mammals. Um, and what I mean by that, of course, is that I have been doing what I do, which is the gathering of information, much of it about computers, some of it about society, since I was in my teens. And I have hit that weird stride where now I'm known for it. And in fact, I've kind of graduated to uh, almost mimetic in terms of people see things are gone. They say, you should call Jason Scott as if I'm some sort of uh, spirit you should light a candle for. But then I do show up because people tell me to go to this Reddit thread or this Twitter thread and speak to the person because the general story is, somebody has something and it is in danger of being lost and maybe you can help. And that's kind of where I am. But where I got there was that when I was a teenager, and so I'm born in 1970 and my parents got a modem uh, or I should say my father got a modem from work at IBM. And I had used computers in my single digits when my father had brought me to the IBM Research Center in, uh, in New York and plunked me onto a 3279X terminal to play adventure and other games because he had to go in on the weekends of visitation after the divorce. And I, of course, was transfixed. I had no idea that this was a thing a machine could do, both on the idea of like a color terminal, which a 3279 terminal is, and also that there would be a game that gave you a illusion anyway of having infinite possibility. And if you're young enough, and I was, you can even convince yourself that these games are writing the story as you go along, uh, something which we get now in reality, but at the time seemed beyond belief for me. And when one of my friends had told me that his grandfather had a modem and I didn't know what that meant, and it was a, you know, acoustic modem that he plugged in and we connected to a machine that wasn't in the house and text was coming through, that was it for me. That was incredible. And, and that began a journey of about 10 or 12 years of going on to bulletin boards. But unlike a lot of people, uh, and I did listen to some of the stories, um, I was really uh, affected by my parents' divorce. I was a child abduction. I had been you know, pulled out during the day and uh, on the run for 30 days and so on. And I had a real sense that you couldn't depend on anything. You know, that there wasn't really any dependable base. So you had to take action. And if you didn't take action, you got what you deserved. And that manifested itself in some pretty interesting ways. But one of them was that when I called bulletin boards, and I loved calling bulletin boards all over the country, getting in trouble for phone bills, staying up till five in the morning, uh, I kept what I saw. I would download all of the G files, the text files, the info files that were sitting on these bulletin board systems. I would buffer their messages. I would buffer their title screens and keep the BBS lists and all of the parts of it that were supposed to be disposable of the week I would keep. And it was a habit I built up uh, of preserving this thing because I loved it so much. And those became a stack of floppy disks. And I used bulletin boards you know, well into my late teens, uh, then at college, uh, I was lucky enough to get on the internet. Uh, I was using the internet for things and I stopped calling bulletin boards with any regularity. I would go on to them, but now it was like, you know, visiting a, a bar or a restaurant that you no longer lived in the town for. It wasn't something that I did on the regular. I was using these, you know, 
what felt like the infinite world of the, the bulletin board system, which meant I was lucky enough to be there for the dawn of the World Wide Web, to be fascinated that something as simple as HTML could produce these color images and color layouts that previously had been unbelievably expensive to put together. So I traveled along that journey. And somewhere in the middle of the 90s, I had perceived that the World Wide Web was not just the future, but that it was um, a craft center. It was something where you could build a meaningful place and people could inhabit that space. So all of my creative juices were pulled into that. It could be visual, it could in some ways be audio, it could be writing and you could link things in ways that people weren't at the time used to. The idea that you could click on a word and know more about that word than you would have ever expected filled me with this idea of the legend of that the, that the internet had everything. So in my late 20s, I got it in my mind uh, one day, boy, wouldn't it be kind of fun to um, find out whatever happened to my favorite old BBS, you know, the Sherwood Forest 2 BBS in, in New York. And I typed in Sherwood Forest into the Alta Vista search engine, and there was nothing about this bulletin board system. And I typed in the number, and then I typed in bulletin board system, because surely there's some site, and there wasn't. And it was like it had never happened. And I found that very odd because I was like, it's the web. Everything's here now. It's 1998. What are we waiting for? And I remembered that I had this stack of floppy disks at home in my parents' house. So I went ahead and grabbed them and took the data off them. And I ended up with a few thousand text files, uh, files, everything from menus to how to's to stories to, uh, you know, GIF files and everything else. And I said, okay, let's put it on the web. And at the time in 1998, I had a lot more freedom in terms of what text, uh, sorry, what uh, domain I could choose. And I had already owned cow.net. You know, I, like, I had, like I had this feeling like ah, I can get any domain I want. And I chose text files because I had been uh, entranced by text files from the beginning and registered textfiles.com and began building a site. In 1998, the site is a nostalgia site. It's meant to say, okay, this time is over, but did you know this was important? And there's always a set of people who feel that need, the, the cataloging need to be the, the small museum of trinkets of things that affected them earlier. I have all these polished stones. I'm gonna make a polished stones closet, maybe even get a side of a building or, or, or have a booth or in, other, in some way, take this part of my life. And these were the polished stones that I had. I had text files of everything from bomb making to erotica to uh, mundane overviews on how to fix different cards on the PCAT so that they would work in that machine. You know, like it was the gamut of what people thought, right? Like what people thought was going to be a, uh, uh, important to spread to others. And I put them all up and it immediately got attention. Um, textfiles.com went from just a weird little project in my home to uh, being known at the time for, you know, being this place where all of these previously lost files were. And one of the magical things that happened was that people reached out to me and said, you know, I collected text files as well. And so they would send me literal CD-ROMs of all their text files. And so I added them to the site. And now suddenly the site had tens of thousands of these things with descriptions and, and uh, very rough classification. I still laugh at the fact that a lot of my classification is based off of a 15 year old. You know, I, when I was 15, I classified them. I made up my own, you know, folksonomy, my own sorting mechanism for creating these things. I was this young nascent librarian working in total outsider art fashion of like, what will I call it? So this was like, you know, looking back on it, it's just adorable because if it was literally like like the doll in, in Toy Story with Andy written on his foot, that's what it is looking at these. They might as well be in crayon and have reverse letters. But I used it and I still use it. The humor, um, freaking, hacking, anarchy, uh, computer, BBS, BBS lists, Apple, you know, like just things that I thought were things that people would classify them on without any, having anybody to speak to. I also 
made a very weird aesthetic decision that the whole thing would be on green text on a black background. Because for me, monochrome green text was aesthetically the center of it. So I did that in 1998. To explain how I ended up making a five hour bulletin board system documentary, um, I got this weird idea in 2000. And the weird idea was, man, bulletin boards always had one phone number um, or more, but one phone number that they kept. And if they changed their names, they had to keep the phone number because it was such a pain to swap it out. And I have all these BBS lists because I kept everything, right? And I have all these BBS information files. What if I started collating that? What if I started finding every BBS listed in every BBS list? And what would that list look like? So after a week of hacking, I had bbslist.textfiles.com. And it was, I think at the time, 45,000 BBS lists, BBSs, I mean. Uh, and I would collate it to go, if this list is from 1986, we can assume this BBS is from that time. And therefore, if we find it in 1982 to 1992, it listed from here to here. And I'll reverse track the exchanges and I'll, you know, uh, uh, know what town it was in kind of and, and, and so on. Like, so it was a series of like, what information can I glean? And just the kind of project that any person will find themselves doing. Like, wouldn't it be funny if starts you on a six month journey that others have to pull you out of? So that's like, you know, uh, what I had there. So bbslist.textfiles.com now has like 150,000 uh, numbers. But one of the side effects of all this was that, and I didn't really understand this at the time, it functioned as a honeypot because people would type in the name of their bulletin board system as I had done in 1998. And it would suddenly show up in this pantheon of automatically generated BBS lists based on area code. And people would suddenly get the erroneous impression um, that I had sat quietly as a scribe reading over my records of having visited their bulletin board system. And I had gently placed a memorial to their work up there, that it wasn't programmatic, that it was a crafted list. And they would send me corrections that still, when I look back on them, seem so specific. They would say, well, it appears that you have the Pumpkin Master BBS listed from 1984 to 1987. And I'll have you know that it was uh, 1984 to 1989. So if you could correct that, I would really prefer it because I don't think that's really what you intended. And so suddenly, as I'm getting dozens and dozens of these, I realize I've only done half the work. The only thing I've done now is collated a bunch of artifacts. It might as well be a bucket of bones, a bunch of, you know, uh, flinted uh, arrowheads and some bones and a couple arranged rocks that look like they have marks on them and nothing else. And here were all these people who were the real story of the bulletin board system. So I invited people through a forum to send me corrections and updates and I asked them to write stories. And what I would find is people would write multi-paragraph stories to be added to their entry. I ran the bulletin board list. I sorry, I ran this bulletin board. It went from here to here. I met my wife on it. It was wonderful. My best friend was on there when he died. I, I missed him so badly, but I'm always remembering the time. You know, like true honest narratives of a life lived online and with these bulletin boards. And I had a dormant film degree because it doesn't pay. Um, and I thought, well, it's 2000. I guess nobody is going to make the bulletin board system documentary. I guess I better make it. So that was the next four years of my life. Um, I interviewed about 205 people. I spoke to about 2,000, 3,000 people. I went to 30 states because I was really driven by the fact that if I didn't do this, this was it. So I did it, and uh, in 2005, the BBS documentary came out on three DVDs, eight episodes, few dozen bonus features, piles of handcraftedness, you know, 
a real humdinger of a work, you know, because I thought, well, this is the one and only film I'm ever going to make because I make money as a system administrator. Um, I'm not going to make films. And it, it did very well. It sold very well. Um, good amount of money came into it. I sold in total, I, think, I believe it was 8,500 copies of that thing. And um, it was Creative Commons licensed. So I made sure that, you know, all of the, uh, the, the stuff was available to people. And I'd always said that I hoped it was the worst BBS documentary ever made and that there'd be one coming back afterwards and it would be really much more. Uh, that never happened. There haven't really been a whole lot of bulletin board system documentaries that go into the level that I did. Um, like there's an entire episode of nothing but Phytonet, right? An entire episode of nothing but ANSI artists and an, an episode of, you know, uh, four pay BBSs and so on, where I'm like, this subject needs to be told, you know. And um, anyway, that cemented me as the oracle of bulletin board system history. And so just like the beginning of this meeting, I am a small candle that causes this, a miasma and soup of nostalgia that centers around as people remember that time. And I can think of worst ways to live, uh, constantly surrounded by fond memories. I was right about having to move fast. Uh, here in 2021, easily a quarter of the participants are gone um, for various reasons. Some surprised me by being gone at the age of 30 or 32 in a couple cases. Um, some were just very old when I interviewed them. Others uh, got sick, um, but then they were gone. Their stories were gone and their interviews had gone anywhere from 20 minutes was the shortest one. The, the longest one was four hours. And so I put all of that, that's all that's available now. So like I've, I've since made it available because, you know, it's one thing to have people in a movie, but I wanted these narrative stories of what this world was. So there's 250, 255 hours of interviews. So it's also an oral history project. Now, separate to this, I was like, well, that was a fun four years. That killed my marriage. What else can I do that's even more obscure? So that's why I ended up doing a documentary on text adventures called Git Lamp, which is also out there. So great. The, 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 the text adventure documentary was also made. I made one last film before hanging it up um, about a hacker convention called DEF CON. But, but after that, people were always like, Jason, could you make more? And I was like, nope. You know, uh, by the time when I first started making them, I was 30. By the time I was in my late 40s, I felt that I didn't have the energy to do these subjects right the way that I did them. So, And also, they felt very energy consuming. There were times that I would drive 150, 150 miles to do one interview and drive 150 miles back. And without a lot of money and everything else, and who's going to spend the money to make an obscure documentary about this chip or that? So I, I got out of it for other reasons I'll go into. Meanwhile, textfiles.com ground on. I started adding collections of artwork, of um, uh, graphics, art scenes, I called it, audio, tape recordings, uh, you know, phone conferences and so on. Uh, and I just started adding because I realized it was all kind of like part of it. It wasn't fair to have this there and not have, you know, pictures of Apple II crack screens or pictures of, um, you know, ANSI and RIDI, you know, remote teletype art and, and so on. Like if I, it wouldn't be fair for me to say, no, this is where it ends. And that expansiveness is, uh, cost me a lot of time. Um, so I went on with this for a long time. In, in 2009, uh, my job finally got rid of me for, among other things, being a documentary filmmaker, working as an IT guy. And I decided to pivot and just become a full-time archivist. And I was very lucky. Um, and I ended up joining with the Internet Archive in 2011. And I've been with them for now for 10 years. And my title is, as I said, free range archivist. I gave it to myself. It just meant I do what I need to. Um, 
I have overseen the uploading of over four petabytes of data to the Internet Archive. So they kind of got the devil's bargain. They got exactly what they asked for. Please give us lots of stuff we don't have. And I went, OK, and here you go. So I love my job because it's a job that's based in good. It's based in the idea that people have materials that they care about, but they're not sure how to make it available to others. And I help them. So uh, in the back of this um, room that people, some of the people can see, uh, you know, piles of videotapes. These are actually anime fan subs that I'm ripping. Uh, anime fan subs were 1990s phenomena of uh, Japanese animation where people would use Amigas to do genlocked subtitles. And they, they got very passionate about it. And so many of the subtitles insult the other groups. I found this fascinating. People who were doing a service, but were also extremely controlling of it. So I've just been digitizing these. And there's other media here, floppy disks, cassette tapes, um, you know, helping people get what they have up onto the uh, internet archive. And, and you know, that, that continues, that work continues. In 2021, I am in every way a dinosaur. Um, the world I grew up in is very gone. The approach to computers, which shifted and went through a lot of changes, is much different than it used to be. Um, many of the things that we've accomplished now are the dreams we dreamed of. Uh, some of them have turned out to be ridiculous nightmares, and some of them have turned out to be even so good that we don't even recognize that they are, a, you know, a basis of anything. You know, the fact that uh, I, I can wake up in the morning, realize I have to visit somebody in another town and just say out loud, how do I get from here to here? And a machine responds is to me still miraculous, and I'm enjoying it for the moment. Um, the ability to watch films that I dreamed of seeing when I was young, the ability to communicate with friends instantly, that I often have conversations with people who it would have been um, uh, pain itself to get a hold of. Now we just talk each other, to each other ambiently across conversations that wind for months. Um, all that aspect of it, I've continued to, to really adore and I've, I've, I've loved it. But also I have found myself greater a greater and greater embarrassment to some, a confusion to others, and running afoul of folks to, who have grown up in a different world. I'll give one that's really great for this crowd. I will tell you, well, you know, as we know right now, there's a lot of controversy over one specific subject, and I have come down really hard on that subject. I'm in the minority and I'm fighting people. I will not install HTTPS on my web server. And the reason I won't do that <laughs> is twofold. Uh, number one, I find it really annoying and I don't like how it's done. And number two, I think it gives a false sense of security for access to text files. I think it takes away the, um, the weight of uh, responsibility away from the end user and makes them feel that things are fine. But now over time, there's kind of a secret third reason, which is just, I adore the controversy. In a world where things, people fight so hard over so many things, the, the, the utter horror that textfiles.com has absolutely no uh, SSL connection to it. It's just text files. Um, I'm, I'm quite happy to, to, to be at the edge of that particular controversy. The site is still compatible with the Lynx text browser. Uh, it is meant to work with screen readers. I don't know how well it does sometimes, but it mostly should. Um, it is one of the few places that you can test uh, unusual connections to because it will not try. For instance, um, there's a site called oldweb.today. It is run by a friend associate of mine named Ilya Kremer, and it is amazing. It uses the Wayback Machine, and you can visit any site back in the past and it will bring up a javascript emulation of the machine and browser that would have been contemporary to that time in other words you can say i wish to look at netscape.com in 1998 
running a Netscape version 2.0 browser and it'll work. Um, it has to do such backflips and such tricks to work with some modern sites. And of course, after a while, none of them work at all, but it always works with textfiles.com. Um, so it's a to me, the thrill of the debate is great because the stakes are so incredibly low. Textfiles.com can be downloaded in one big swoop. Uh, archive.org has a tar and gz file. You can just download um, the entire site, which I think is about, uh, well, it's 600 megabytes. Um, so you can just download it as one big swoop, put it on your local Linux box, um, put it on a Raspberry Pi connected to an SSD, and you're good to go. Uh, I've never, this is just built into everything I do. I've never tried to exert overarching control. The BBS documentary can be viewed for free on YouTube, on my own site. It can be viewed by others who've made it available. To some small extent, people have made commentaries about it. Um, same thing with GitLamp, same thing with you know, DEF CON documentary. And so textfiles.com, I never really fell into the fact that just because I was the person who was compiling them that I executed ownership over them. They weren't mine. I was a curator with stones. And so I've always tried very hard to make my material be that you can get it without telling me. And I'm finding that a lot of this is not very compatible with the modern world. People are growing up now. Um, I mean, when I was in, in the 90s, um, I remember seeing two children walk up to a, um, a touch screen at the airport and they pressed it and it did things. And then I watched them, you know, five years old, running around between different billboards and touching them because surely this is how everything works. You can just touch it and everything will work. And now a lot of things do. Like kids are aware. I mean, like, you know, when you think about the fact that children of a certain age which is to say, you know, anything from two years old onward to, you know, what is getting becoming shockingly older now, have never known a world that their parents didn't have for them a small light square that told them the world's secrets and could entertain them for the rest of their lives with distractive cartoons, voices, sounds, music forever. Like that's, what do you do? when that's there. I mean, in my youth, um, what we had to some extent as a divorce, you know, a child in divorce, I had an incredible amount of physical freedom. You know, I could walk around the neighborhood and, and cause my father had lived in a basically a cul-de-sac neighborhood and that was my piece. So I couldn't comprehend the world outside of that, of course, but to me, that's how the world worked. And now kids are very used to it. Um, and, but, but built into that are processes and systems of control, of analysis, of response, of, of rules and laws that hit them at a certain level, you know, uploading certain things and then finding out that a shadowy organization has informed them that they can't do it. It plays too much of something. And that they, don't, they, just, they just have accepted that that's kind of like this thing in the background. Maybe in their later years, they'll, they'll ask hard questions, but that's become a part of their lives as well. Subsequently, you know, some of the items that are on textfiles.com have long fallen out of favor as being in the, in the kind of things you want to distribute freely, but to me, they're historical documents. And that debate rages and continues. Um, textfiles.com is banned by basically every um, internet filtering site. Um, it is banned in a lot of school systems, it is banned. You know, it is very hard uh, to avoid it, but it is possible for lots of places to try. And I recognize that. Like, I don't consider it injustice. I just recognize it for what it is. Um, as I as I uh, hit twenty years of textfiles.com, um, a very amazing phenomenon started to happen and continues to happen. I, I'm lucky, I get fan mail. I get occasional death threats and hate mail, but I, I mostly get fan mail. And the fan mail comes at the range of anywhere between twice a week to a few times a month. 
and they're always very similar. They're always very like, I did this, you know, just want to let you know you're cool. I mean, I wrote fan mail to, um, uh, to Dennis Ritchie and John Postel and, and, you know, like I've written, if I felt somebody affected my life, I, I try to write a, a, a letter and being on the receiving end of it, I realize how hard it is to respond to those. You don't know what to tell people for the fact that you lived your life. But I have found that I take the template of Steve Wozniak, who I've had the pleasure of knowing uh, for a number of years and who I've interacted with on multiple occasions, which is simply to be as gracious as possible, as open as possible, and to treat them like they're an old friend instead of a, a, a new suspicious fan. And um, that's been pretty powerful to do. And I try to give people time, talk on the phone. Sometimes I'll call them, speak with them. Um, but one of the things that kind of came back was people who had told me that they were entering engineering school because when they were teenagers, they read computer engineering files on textfiles.com or that they had like, gotten into different subjects because they had read about them on textfiles.com, which to them was an unfettered library of unusual and weird items, which even in 1998 were shockingly out of date, totally, you know, uh, uh, out of out of complete uh, synchronicity with what people do now. But what was important was that it lit a fire in them. This stuff existing lit a fire so that they wanted uh, to be a part of it. Um, and so textfiles.com, which was in itself meant to be a um, remembrance, a, rem a remembering of institutions that were gone, right? Uh, uh, pieces of, of the, the story of, of the past um, was now itself an institution, now found itself a harbinger of a previous time, a, a small temple that people would step into to glance upon what once was. And I never prepared for that. I never prepared to being in that. Um, but I've taken the same policy of it that I've taken with a lot of things, which is what I always encourage people, which is to assume the best of folks who find what you do good, to thank them for letting you know, and to knowing if you can help in any way. Because usually what comes out of a lot of these is questions and people are looking for answers and they're looking for a sympathetic ear. Some people just tell me long stories and they, 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 they head off. They give me the, I used to call it the, the seven minute story. It was the, more, the story that comes at the beginning of every BBS interview because somebody has taken a camera to their house and said, I care about this, this part of what makes you, you tell me about it. And they've built up a globe, a snow globe of memories. And they've put it together and that's their story. And that's what I uh, want to get from them and provide it with them. Um, so in terms of like, you know, how I feel about the journey I've taken. Well, I'm, I'm a series of very lucky situations. I could have gone in many different directions, some light, some dark, some bland. I probably still would have dressed rather flamboyantly, but it would have been to a very small crowd of friends who always knew that I was going to be the most embarrassing person at the restaurant or that I was going to be the loudest voice on the beach or I was going to be the voice that echoed up and down in the hallway at the office at work. You know, that would be my place, but I'm very lucky like I said at the beginning, I now represent an idea. And in some ways that's nice. Celebrity is always fascinating in its own way. But what really matters to me is the, the actual idea that people have made me the embodiment of, which is our past is important and our voices matter long after they're silenced. And it matters incredibly to people to know that some amount of energy rides out there for a sympathetic ear to understand that they have something they want to tell and that there's a danger it'll disappear and maybe maybe just maybe the conversation you have with them will preserve it that's where i stand i'm very happy with it and uh 
thanks for letting me tell you about it. Sure, that's great. I'm sure we have some questions. Absolutely. I'll start off. I, I'm very concerned about the, the uh, Internet Archive. I'm, I'm so worried that it's going to pass some legal boundary and disappear. And is, is, there, is there any duplication of another effort that's legally independent entity that, that's collecting this data as well? Yes. I can't tell you anything about it. <laughs> yes. Okay. I can tell you that you could, I'll put it this way, and don't quote me on this. Um, you could, you could, I mean, please send a warning call before you do it, but you could blow up the building and nothing will change. Good. Um, but, um, I mean, well, it'll be an annoying week or two, but, um, you know, uh, uh, precautions have been made. Um, this is someone's life work and he has a lot of money. He cares very deeply. In fact, that's one of the things that I'm very happy to have worked with. So, so when I first joined the Internet Archive, my first natural question being a New Yorker was, so is this a scam? Is this something that's for something else? Am I part of a bird watching group and they're dealing drugs? Is this part of a you know, uh, a simple accounting business, but they do work for the mob. You know, like, is, is there a dark side to this? Is this all being done for some sort of underhanded um, reason? And I've spent 10 years on it. No, this is a guy who friggin' loved books. He loves books so much. He named his firstborn son, his firstborn son after his favorite book font. Uh, his wife has run a nonprofit for understanding the story of the book for years. He sold a company for about $9 million, which made him pretty independent. And then he started another company, and that company was sold to Amazon for $200 million in Amazon stock in 1996. So he's fine. He's doing good. If he's waiting in line, it's because he chose to. And what I tell people is this guy could, well, in the tour, I give a tour. Okay, so there's a tour we'll give of the building. And occasionally they let me do the tour and that's always a mistake. But the, the line I always say to them is this guy could have bought an island that isn't on any map and have endangered species fight to the death and eat the winner. He could make a phone call and have a black helicopter pick him up on the roof of the shopping mall he's in. And what he said to himself with all this money and all of this stuff was, I really want to be a librarian. I really want to run an archive. I really want to see if I can help bring as much knowledge to as many people as possible. And he gets in a bike in his house and he bikes to work and he's a librarian for 12 hours a day and then he bikes home which to me is the greatest will, you know, demonstration I've ever seen. That's how much this guy loves this. And so I can guarantee you that the material that he has spent 25 years of his life helping to amass has plans for its longevity. But over the years, they've not really spent a lot of, they, they've not found much benefit in going into it too explicitly. But that is definitely under underway. Uh, I understand people are concerned. There is a lawsuit going on, which I can't comment on. Um, but uh, uh, other than I will say that um, the, the legal team on the side of the Internet Archive is incredible. Um, I mean, a truly incredible legal team. I... If we have, if if we end up in a negative space or some other problem related to the lawsuit, it will not be because we hired clunky lawyers or picked up whoever we could get for free. These are these are these are time proven. They will make the best argument in favor of our argument. 
and we'll see where it goes. But that's about all I can say, which was probably more than I'm allowed to say. And there's probably a lawyer right now and she just woke up in her bed going like, what, something just happened. Where's Jason? What's he on? Is Jason on somewhere? So there you go. <laughs> okay, thank you. But I mean, I mean, respect the thing and definitely always download stuff that matters to you. I, mean, I always encourage that anyway. So if there's material you see on there and it's downloadable, download it. Always keep a local copy. Don't trust anything. The world is crazy and has all sorts of interlocking infrastructural aspects. And, you know, one, one broken water pipe here, one unfortunate squirrel there, and suddenly New York City is plunged in darkness. We've seen that before. Um, so, you know, trust but verify, I guess, is the way to go. But as a person who has dedicated 10 years of his life to that organization, along with people who have dedicated more than that. Um, I'm not worried. <laughs> I'll try to keep the other answers shorter. Sorry about that. Go ahead. That's fine. Anyone else? Chime, I think you wanted to talk. Um, I think I'm un unmuted now. Yes, you are. Okay. Um, let's see. So I have about maybe three or four questions. I don't know if you want me to take a one at a time and wait for your answers or how you want to do this. Just go one, one at a time, one at a time. I'll try to make it that each one isn't a, uh, my, there's a, there's a lovely uh, librarian activist named Jessamine West and her nickname for me is 47 minute answer. So I'll try to oh. keep them shorter. <laughs> okay. Well, I, in your um, discussion, you never mentioned once the word CompuServe where you're never on there. Oh, I was on CompuServe. Uh, mm -hmm. I went on, grabbed a whole bunch of text files and left. Um, I was never very good at playing the game of sneaking picture, uh, sneaking uh, a look at the uh, test passwords, which kids would do. Oh. Uh, and my family didn't own a CompuServe account, so I would only get on the CompuServe for a very short period of time. Um, I have been involved. Oh, wow, I'm not even allowed to discuss all that. Um, well, the there are... Oh. There are rooms, that, there are CompuServe artifacts that are being protected, but nobody can talk about it because everyone's all nervous. But um, I consider CompuServe to be incredibly important. I've always listed it as one of my great lost, like if you could do anything, could you do anything about it? But I'm happy to say that I'm not the only one who recognizes its value. And uh, I believe that while we may have much of it that is lost, we will at least have a piece of it. Um, I never got onto the source, never got onto Prodigy. Um, I was always riding cheap. So it was BBSs straight to, uh, there was a dial-in in, in uh, Boston that allowed you to get into the MIT system to Telnet to uh, internet hosts. And I would find free internet hosts and use them until they closed up. So I was always, you know, brown bagging it and running in during free museum day and totally. And so... I know of and I have artifacts from, but I'm not a part of it. That's why they're not my narrative. The the um, the nice thing about CompuServe is the material was separate from what you'd find on on the web or in Usenet, whatever. It was completely separate people, separate material. I mean, I yep. used to, I used to download these. Uh, I guess you you'd say they were the precursor to MP3s. They were called mod files. Yep. And uh, and it was wonderful, you know. And uh, um, and then. Um, uh, the, the forums and the libraries and the, the thing that I certainly noticed about, I, I was on CompuServe for maybe three years until they went to this H, what the heck was it, HDMI interface or something. It wasn't friendly anymore with the, you know, with a, a DOS screen reader. Right. Yeah. And so I left and I, I had a, a, a shell account by then uh, on Netcom and eventually PrimeNet and so on and so on, you know, and um the thing, uh, uh, the thing what I noticed is, of course, not only were the people on CompuServe uh, knowledgeable, but once the internet came around, of course, you know, especially when Windows 95 came along, then any old grandmother who knew nothing about computers could get on there. I was like, I think that ruined everything, you know, <laughs> just that was well, an editorial. Um, I mean, I mean, for what it's, I mean, I'll just, I'll quickly say that I understand what you're saying, but I also understand that it's an inevitable part of progress. And I think that if a community considers itself to be above other sets of people, 
it builds the seeds of its own destruction regardless. Mm -hmm. So there's pros and cons to it. I definitely think that a community that doesn't recognize that at the end of the day, some people don't want to talk to each other and they do want to have an ability to control the flow of what's going in and, and working hard to be able to control that. If they don't do something about that, people get overwhelmed. Um, the idea that you couldn't create a private group and have it work among it so you didn't have to turn every day into a flood of what's going on with the world is is a sign of a 1990s era service as opposed to a 2020s era service. Well, well we didn't have spam on CompuServe. I mean, only once did I ever get an email from somebody who said, uh, we need your password for something. And I, when I realized it was it was a scam, I called CompuServe in Ohio and they said, well, can you send it to us? And I, right. Uh, but, but you were you were paying quite a bit for that privilege, though. Um, I forgot how much it was a month. I don't remember now. <laughs> it was a it was a lot. Mm. You were you were buying a Call of Duty game every month for the ability to be able to uh, have that control, which is why, um, you know, I, yeah. this would not be the night for the debate about the for pay versus for free right. model and right. ad well, supported. But yeah. Yeah, and uh, so my next subject is the Internet Archive. Sure. Which, uh, which um, uh, many years ago used to be quite accessible to me. Now it's a, a, a quote, mishmash, unquote. I mean, with links, that's L-Y-N-X as opposed to the other ones, you know. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, there's a lot of, uh, I assume they're JavaScript buttons. They don't say anything. There's no From link. Robert to everyone. Jesus Christmas. There's... Um, uh, there's no, uh, I, I don't know, it's just a mess. I yes. Was, yeah, I, I was going to ask you, though, with the New York Times archives, how come they never, well, maybe they have them and they just didn't put them up, the printer-friendly uh, versions of those articles, they're not there. Sure. If you, if you follow the link to them, it uh, fails. Yeah. Um, so to, to several... Um... Several points there. Um, first of all, I have to, uh, in terms of the New York Times thing, a lot of that is because, um, you know, we save things at a certain rate and then certain depths don't go down and we end up with a situation where we don't get certain versions of the articles. In terms of New York Times specifically, that is a for pay product in many ways. And as a result, there are maintained archives elsewhere that we don't have direct access to, but they do. And so they kind of, now we might have something on the back end we don't talk about, but we try not to be like our, we've determined over the years that when we get into the search engine on top of the original and the original is still around, the original gets very, very cranky. Mm. So if somebody is like, oh, you know, we have a website for ferrets and then we're like, come to our ferret archive first. Um, those folks get very cranky and reasonably so it's because it, we're saying like, why even go there? You know, it's kind of weird. Um, it's like a librarian running through a bookstore, screaming through a thing. These are all free at our place, which is both true and rude. So we're, we're always suffering with that. That's also an example of like in, you know, the 1990s and 2000s, we were just another weird thing, but we've quickly become this other bit. You're speaking to the other part and um, without going too much into internal gossip and politics. Yeah, there's a bit of a civil war about that, mm. about accessibility. Yeah. And there yeah. are those of us who think of it as we're pretty furious about the reduced accessibility and others who are proud of the level of accessibility that is there <sighs> and so on. Mm. And I am definitely on the side that, and again, I'm speaking for myself, I long ago thought that the Internet Archive should be more flexible with control of its interface. Now, we have a command line interface for the Internet Archive. It's, it's a Python thing called IA, and I do everything through it. It's, it's called Internet Archive. It's like pip install Internet Archive, works on Linux. Oh. And it gives you basically a uh, bunch of commands. So you can say pip search, uh, I don't know, uh, Ant-Man dash i and it'll give you all the identifiers that match that and then you can actually say pip search you know ant-man 
media type colon texts and it'll give you just the text with Ant-Man. And I have a bunch of bash scripts that I do most of my work with the internet archive through that. Mm. And I know therefore that it is within the realm of possibility and it's certainly within the realm of somebody's possibility that if we have an API that this thing is using, that there's no reason we shouldn't have variant interfaces to the archive mm -hmm. so that there, and frankly, along other lines, there should be a kids only That's interface. Right. There should be a academics only interface. We, we just added the internet archive scholar, which we haven't talked about where we basically scoped through the uh, Wayback machine for millions of academic articles that were otherwise lost, mm -hmm. which is neat, but it was like somebody's pet project for like 12 months. Yeah. I would love for us to have more robust accessibility. I am definitely one of the crowd who's just like, why aren't we doing this? Why are we doing this? Why don't we have something? Um, I suspect whenever I see something that the internet archive doesn't have, it's usually a matter of taking our relatively meager resources and not aiming it towards it. But I have also discovered, this isn't a very satisfying answer, but I've also discovered that we work pretty well with outside folks when they come to us with a vector and we help them. Like as long as they're not trying to turn it to a product. So if a person is like, Robert a bunch of us Washington. want the ability to uh, make the internet archive accessible to screen readers again along this way, and we wanna make a separate client for reaching it, we'd be like, here you go. You know, I might even be able to give you a, uh, you know, a prompt on a Linux box that's very close to it in terms of um, mm. bandwidth, you know, to be able to do it. Like, like we would do it because it wasn't costing anything out of the, out of the, the budget. Mm -hmm. um, we would never be like, no, our things, that's not where it's coming from. It's more like, oh no, that will require three developers for X amount of time. Um, so I'm sympathizing with what you're saying. Um, well, the I mean more people tell us this, my hope is that it will move the needle. We spent a lot of time trying to be mobile accessible, you know, like phone accessible, um, but not really accessible to the blind. And I, you know, considering the amount of material that is there that is blind friendly, mm -hmm. I really wish we would do it. So no, I sympathize completely with the situation. I mean, as a news junkie, I tend to look for my favorite things on there. Uh, yeah. A certain political guy who was vice president, who, you know, who I, I have my own website about him, and that was uh, Humphrey. And I look for things that interest me. And, and a lot of times uh, I can't find them, or if I find them, I, I, it's a mishmash to get to them. And, yeah. uh, and, then, the, and then about those uh, you know, newspaper or magazine articles, in general, I mean, Robert they, has left the meeting. Um, the uh, these people coming and going or keep talking into the thing. Um, the uh, you know, down trying to download or, or uh, print uh, articles that have uh, 150. I mean, you go to like the LA Times website and it's got at least 150 links in a toolbar before you get to anything. It's like, that's sure, the, it's ridiculous. Now, luckily. There's a tool now that you can use with links called RDR View that strips a lot of that out. So you have to use it as, a, as an external in links to get that done. Uh, but it's not perfect. <laughs> yeah. And um, so, so, yeah, no, like I said, I sympathize. I don't like the situation um, where the, the, the area that I work on, the area where I work is not, doesn't get near it. Um, but I have, I'm, I'm not forgiving anything, but I'm just saying yeah. I'm, I'm on the side. I'm on the side and I bring it up where I can yeah. Yeah, uh, I mean, and just say, I think this is, a, I, I do think it's one of our strongest failings, frankly. I mean, golf, golfer sites certainly didn't look like this. No, I know. <laughs> yeah. Um, it was really not, I, I surely remember going to the, the Voice of America site and it was just completely raw. I mean, well, not raw text, but you know, it didn't have links of any kind on it. It was great. Yeah, no, and there's a, absolutely a, um, for what it's worth, many of the books are accessible through Daisy, but I don't know, you know, how easy we make it to even get to them. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Yeah. Like it's there, um, but 
there might be something there. And and I'm I was just now trying to search for it and I can't find it. And I'm sure you know this thing. There was a cassette magazine that would like ran through like the 70s and the 80s. I've completely forgotten the name of it. And it was a cassette, it was for the blind. Play, it, playback? playback. It might be playback. Yeah. And and I made sure we had that like the full archive. Yeah. The, of last, playback. the last thing or two I wanted to quickly get into, and I it's, I don't monopolize a whole 40 minutes, but it's tempting. Um the I, I'm really I used to have more of this and I lost a bunch of stuff, and that's why I was looking for uh, uh, it was Clary, uh, C L A R I. Uh, uh -huh. There were wire stories, and they were on Usenet, and uh, it was like you know, uh, uh, Clary dot something dot world dot. You know, there were a whole bunch of these groups in this hierarchy. I wondered if you. Well, I guess I, I, I'm guessing by your reaction that you don't know what that is, or you don't have them. No, I know what you're talking about. But okay, are, are those archives around anywhere? I mean, I, we've managed to find some from 95 and six, and then Giga News has them from 2003 on, that's all. Yeah, the archive has Usenet stacks. They may or may not overlap with what uh, Giga News already had, mm -hmm. um, but uh, there is a collection called Usenet. I, um, yeah, see, so we have the Giga News Usenet collection. We have the Usenet historical collection. So there are like, collections but i couldn't speak to whether or not anyone specifically had it but they weren't you know they they, they absolutely weren't um restricted in any way yeah. like we're, we're, there's no situation where the archive is going to go no we don't that we don't like that well that's I, not how we that's I not did, how we roll i did phone the archive and i asked them some of these things and they were going to get back to me about something else i was there's, there's some abc news stuff i'm looking for that I, you know, there was that that uh, documentary. Uh, I want to say her name was Mary, somebody or other. That that uh, she. Built. Mary, yeah, Marion Stokes. Yeah, that was uh, I'm, as a news junkie. I I had nine thousand real to real tapes until I donated them to MSU. So I understand. Yep. But, uh, and and you guys didn't want them because I for one thing. Ronald Walcott has uh, left. For one thing, I think uh, you know you you guys didn't want to pay for shipping, but I I can understand that. But you know. But um, yeah, there's an ABC News. Uh, a it was a network called ABC News Now that I'm looking for stuff from, and nobody has it. I mean, you look around and it's nowhere. And um, at the time, I was living somewhere where I couldn't get, oh, you know, 7.2 where I lived. Right. And for what it's worth, um, I don't know if you've looked at the Vanderbilt News Archive. I so look, talk to the, the Vanderbilt News Archive. Uh huh. They yeah. have a whole bunch of news and a bunch of historical news and a, going back very long, very well recorded, a very, uh, I will say, determined young man who I've dealt with uh, mirrored them. He figured out how to hack them to mirror it, and oh. he mirrored them on the archive, and that oh, led wow. to a great phone call. Oh. Um, but we, you know, we kept the copy, but we just don't make it accessible. Um, oh. But Vanderbilt News has... Um, a surprising amount of historical yeah. news. I mean, I'm, I'm fortunate that I run into YouTube pages, uh, and then I'll finish up here, uh, I, that have a lot of old space coverage from different networks and stuff. And a lot of that, I, I mean, I have two or three of those sites bookmarked in, in YouTube, you know, so that it's nice that stuff is becoming available. Yes, I acknowledge the fact that like video is an incredible resource. We have a lot of it and we do not arrange it as well as we could. Um, and people will take it upon themselves to upload their own archives of materials and it will, will do pretty well. Anyway, thank you. Anyone else has a question? Uh, one person is asking, is that a PDP emulator on the shelf? Yes. Um, this, is a, this is an emulator of a PDP-8. It's a Raspberry Pi with a custom front to make it look like one. I was so charmed by this combination of new and old that I bought it. They are for sale. They sell them uh, assembled and unassembled. I highly suggest assembled. It's worth the extra hundred bucks. And uh, it runs in the background whenever I broadcast because people find it fascinating. Um, and it is functional. That is to say, when I hook it up to a, ser a USB serial connection, I can log in and play games and you know do the whole nine yards. I don't generally do that. I'm pretty busy. But that's, yeah, that's what that is. 
Yeah, but I've been thinking of getting one. Yeah, no, I'm a fan. I mean, <clears throat> I appreciate remixed older technology, uh, which in some ways will have some of its edges um, sanded off so it's not quite the same experience. Um, we have emulation at the archive. We emulate tens of thousands of items. But one of the ones that we emulate that I always find funny is we emulate thousands upon thousands of cassette-based games and programs, which means you have to wait in real time for anywhere between four and seven minutes to load them on the tape. And so you can have the experience of having your life go away by just going to my ZX81 or Commodore 64 collections, going to the cassette sections and saying, I'm going to sit there for nine minutes and I don't have to. There's no real cassette. It's just acting like a cassette. Um, and you can tell yourself like, yeah, but you won't see the loading screens and the stuff. And I'm like, most people don't want to see the loading screens. So um, I'm always fascinated by that, by like having just enough of what used to be there and what's new. And, you know, just like I, I think people love history, but they don't like, you know, dying of 37 because they broke a leg. Um, I think that there's ways to like mitigate that and have a sense of what was there. My hope is that it's just people looking for respect. Like, they're just like, I want to, I want people to respect what came before. And it's not always been this way. And people worked hard to get us where we are. And I'm like, yeah, I acknowledge that. That doesn't mean I have to sit for nine minutes to play tic-tac-toe. Anyway. Well, another question for anyone. I have a question. Sure. Uh, so first I want to say that um, I, I, as someone who has found myself just really loving some software and not having anything to do at all with the core development of it and yet becoming a person who talks about it um i find myself um on reddit someone says oh i installed ubuntu it's great and i love it and i try I, you know this is my old computer i can't afford a new one now it's brand new and i jump in occasionally and say um thank you we make ubuntu just for you and, and because i'm a name and that just people get happy uh, and so um i I'm really uncomfortable with that responsibility, but I've started to recognize in the last few years, oh no, I I kind of, you know, that's a touchstone that brings people together and sure. it's important. So when you mention, um, at least with textfiles.com, you did create that arc, that collection. And so you can take some credit for that, um, even though it wasn't, you didn't write all the text files. So I was taking notes when you were talking about that, but in the meantime, thank you so much for collecting those stories and continuing to do that. I think it's very important. Yeah, so I'm not, I'm not like, you know, I, I definitely created textfiles.com and the idea of textfiles.com, but my, what I mostly mean is I don't then, like, here's an example. Um, so of course the internet archive, um, we didn't go into it because you'll go, you'll, you'll, it's, it's a lot, but um, the internet archive has a lot being uploaded. We have between 50 and 75 terabytes of new data being added every day. So these, these are huge numbers, right? And it's possible for just folks, just folks to upload things to us. So on an average day, between five and 7,000 items are uploaded by just folks. They range from some of our more, I'll call them intensive uploaders, people who have fallen in love with us and just do it by the hundreds. And somebody who just scans a, literally scans a placemat from a diner and just sends it up. Like it, it can range, it could be one person or some people who just upload random junk. Um, I gave a talk where I showed one, it was just called test. It was empty doc, it was a blank page and it was a test and I'm like, test confirmed, thanks. Um, and um, I will encounter people who will mirror sets of scanned items from elsewhere. And we will get furious calls and letters from those people. So people will scan in catalogs from an electronics chain and have a site with that. And somebody will make a copy and put it on the archive. And they will come to us furious as if we are, as if we literally ferried away their firstborn daughter while she was playing in the backyard, and have taken her away. And he's on the phone with us, and he's he's Liam Neeson, 
And he's like, I have a specific set of skills. I can digitize old consumer catalogs and I will use them to find you. And it's because that they interpret the process of scanning as a, a form of ownership, that they raised it. They, they, they made the conversion. And I have mixed feelings about that position, but I don't dismiss it. I mean, if you spend a lot of time doing something, you can feel very much like it's yours and not having, con and that the one payment you get is to watch people take it from your site. And so if you lose that, you've taken away the one joy. And so we enter into these arguments a lot with people, natural. Um, and as you can imagine with thousands and thousands and thousands of items coming in, there's all sorts of ranges of material. People who are uploading podcasts, they're recording people who are uploading, um, you know, uh, live tapes from their teenage years, you know, air checks. Uh, the Internet Archive air checks collection is amazing. It is just thousands upon thousands of recordings of like rock stations from 1968 and, um, you know, mid 1980s shock jocks. And, and, and um, you know, somebody just uploaded like 95 um, Willard Scott radio from something called joy hour or something that he ran i guess he had a radio show for a while um he was in dc yeah so yeah, the joy boys or something yeah joy boys or something so somebody just uploaded all those it's you like guys have, you guys have an ftp site where we upload stuff to or how do we get it up there uh well the client allows you to do an ia upload identifier you would prefer files and it will go do the rest for you oh, okay um and of course we we used to have an ftp site we we dismissed it we ended up going with um uh an html you know drag and drop oh. um not my favorite either um but that's what we do so people use different methods um so yeah uh anything else nathan or was that uh yeah so when i think back of PBS is when I was like 12, 13, and everyone has their favorite memories that that's a magical time. I remember mainly when you'd sit down at a computer and you'd think, turn it on it boot up, you get a command prompt or something. You think, what do I want this computer to do for the next sure. half hour or, or hour when I work on this? And you do that one thing. They were multi-purpose machines, but they were single tasking more or less. Maybe you run something in the background, solitaire to switch out every 15 minutes but that's what i when i think back i think that's what the magical thing that can never be captured uh in your time uh, when you think back to those days of bbs and so on is there some quality of computing or being online that you miss that you sort of feel nostalgic for you wish could be brought back even if it maybe isn't 100 practical so there's something about that time Sure. Well, let me let me be very specific about this because obviously I've had way too much time to think about it. I draw a very distinct difference between artifacts and experiences. And the reason why, of course, is that like, you know, if there's a difference between being sad because your local bar that served something they called butter beer was amazing and they're gone and um, being sad that butter beer is no longer in your life and the experience of being at the bar with those people in the way that it was, which I think of as a different quality. And so I've spent a lot of time on that because there's artifacts galore that we can say, well, I remember I was on one board and they had this and they went down a few times later and I'll never get those text files back. But that, that falls into that bucket of bones thing that I mentioned before, um, which is just, that's, that's an artifact. In terms of like actual experiences, yeah, obviously using bulletin boards from the ages of like nine to 18 uh, forever wraps it around the experience of being a nervous or self-conscious teenager um, that w is gone. Um, but I do f honestly feel, and, I, and somebody referenced this uh in the chat before this you know um location based communication is a very special specific thing it's redundant let's be clear it's redundant <clears throat> you know you could replace frankly a lot of quote-unquote groups with a book with all the answers and 
the answers would all be there you know like oh i can't um i'm gonna make something up but you know like like oh man i can't get onto the h band on my radio yeah i mean you can replace that with a fact or a video that says to get to the h band on your radio press these two buttons but that's not what it was it was going over to the guy's house a couple of you and like watching some sports because the guy had an amazing tv 19 inches and um helping him with the thing and the three of you like hanging out in the thing afterwards and being like oh that was easy yeah you just got to do this and like that whole human experience of like we met for an arbitrary wish to fix something and we became friends that is a very specific feeling related to bulletin boards because bulletin boards had taken away the physicality of it at all it wasn't like i mean yeah you can meet somebody at the computer store and you can meet somebody at the supermarket but meeting them online and then uh, one of the things the BBS documentary was very specific about talking about was how much of a physical component it was, how much of it was like there was a pizza parlor at somewhere and people would go there. And yeah, you blow it off a lot because you're an idiot kid. But like, you'd know that like that here we all are awkwardly, awkwardly staring at each other over pepperoni. But then it turns out Andrew ordered sardines. Andrew, what the hell's wrong with you, man? Nobody wants a sardine pizza. And now you have a piece of your life that wouldn't be there. And the computer's fostering that. And then somebody uh, keeps posting ASCII sardines whenever he, you know, whenever he posts on the board and nobody understands what the joke is. And then after a while, they just call him Fishman and he either takes it or doesn't. And there's no, you know, you know, my handle on, on the internet in a lot of places is sketch and it's because all i would do is cartoon in college and one guy kept calling me sketch because i was always in the common areas drawing cartoons that's how that happened it was just this proximity and this random thing and i liked the handle it was really cool so i started using it um those constructed worlds are gone now kids are finding their own place and there's like way too much academic thoughts on my part about public versus private space and how different people are adapting. But I mean, I, every time somebody of my age is like, oh, these kids, they don't get that. I'm like, yeah, but you, you could write something heinous because you're a dumb kid on a bulletin board that's now gone. These kids post something, it's 3 million views on TikTok. Next five years of their lives are consumed in a way they can't even explain to their family. So they're walking a much bigger tightrope than we are, we ever did. You know, you're like, oh, five people will think I'm a freak if I do this back in, you know, 84. Um, and you have to take that into assumption and that they're finding their own way in it and they're building things up from it. And um, I both recognize the parallels and recognize that now they are dealing with things on a scale that I never had to, and I should give them a little bit of space um, to, 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 to understand they're going to learn and grow. Um, so maybe that's what's missing is the ability there aren't, it's becoming harder to fail um, where previously failure was part of the process of growing up and we are stripping uh, I could probably get a podcast episode out of this, but we're, we're, you know, we're, we're stripping children of the right to fail because we are turning them into demonst demonstratives and clips. And I get why we've done it. I totally get it. But uh, wow. So that's a lot. That's, that's gone. I, 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 I'm a little worried about that. Do we have time maybe for one more question? For me, fine. It's everybody else. Okay. Hello, Hi. I have a couple of questions. Uh, hello, Jason. I'm not saying I, uh, I think I'm a contemporary. I, 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 I did the BBSs back then, 300 baud and all that. Yeah, you're buzzing like crazy, but I'm, I speak buzz. So oh, be sure to um, mute afterwards. Yeah. So you're doomed. Yeah. Are we better now? No, not at all, but keep going. Ask all the right. question, then mute. 
Okay, a um, couple of questions. One is about the Wayback Machine, and the other one is about um, the future. Yep. And by the way, you woke up Greg, so send him a send him. I'm I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> you woke up Greg Dickerhoof, but uh, let him let the guy. Okay. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah. The uh, question about the Wayback Machine is sometimes I run into a page that cannot be saved on the Wayback Machine, and, I'm, and it's not a robots.txt problem. It's just, uh, just uh, some things it can't capture. I don't know if it's like CSS, you know, sure, what whatever. And then I try maybe another archive service, and then they. Can can capture it. So I'm just wondering whether there's a, a feedback mechanism where the uh, the Wayback Machine might, maybe they would they want to know about this, that there are certain things they... Yes. That aren't getting captured. So that question is easily answered. Just forward to info at archive.org, like half of the first four letters of information, info at archive.org, and uh, that's the, it'll go right into a Zen desk. They'll deal with it. Second question. Yeah, about the future. Um, yeah, I mean, I... Uh, fascination for these things because I lived like you, I lived it, and um, you know, I was on CompuServe, my handle was Quantum Duck. if any of you were there, hello, um, but anyway, yeah, um, so I'm interested in these things, you know, not, you know, oh, partly just, you know, as a nostalgia thing, yeah, I live this stuff, and it's interesting to go back and look, but the other thing is, uh, the other aspect of it that interests me is, you know, what it says about the uh, our present, you know, in, the, in the larger context of, yes, we went through this, but now here we What I'm specifically looking at is that now we've reached this point where a person might have 900 friends on Facebook, yet they don't have uh, a single person who will go out with them on a Sunday afternoon for a cup of coffee. Um, and uh, I think that we've gotten to a point where that's actually considered normal, um, but it doesn't feel normal and, uh, to me. And um, you know, so I'm, I'm just... Uh, if you have a subjective view on where we've arrived and where we're going. Sure. First, mute out. You totally wrecked Greg's nap. I feel so bad. I was so happy. Greg was like, it was like my grandpa had, had a great Thanksgiving. And I was like, oh, I love no, Actually, him. thank you. I don't know if that's what did it, but uh, <laughs> thank you for waking me up. This is I my fourth him, Zoom meeting tonight. I saw him buzz and that was it. No, I... I I have slept through some of the most amazing things in my life. I fell asleep. Uh, my father, I forgot what it was. Why did I do this? You know, it's one of these things. I don't know why. I was 13. Get this. I'm 13. And my father works for IBM. And there's a lecture series. And I was like, I don't know what it was. I was 13. And I was like, Dad, I need to go to this lecture series. It is important that I go to it to take me there. And I'm trying to imagine my poor dad, um, he must be, let me see, 43. And his idiot 13 year old son is like, dad, I know you work at IBM all the time, but I want you to get up and pick me up at six o'clock and take me to a seven o'clock, two hour lecture from an academic four times during the summer. Um, most of my life in my fifties has been reliving and understanding what it must've been like from my dad. Anyway, one of them was Isaac Asimov which is great. And the other three were not Isaac Asimov. And one guy was so not Isaac Asimov, I completely fell asleep, like just super buzz, gone. And I'm just trying to imagine my dad like, oh, great kid, kid, I've done a great job. I'm the best father in the world. I've allowed you to come here and snore louder than this academic. Um, anyway, um, yeah, the line, so there was a buddy of mine, uh, you might know them as, um, Mark Pilgrim, who had done a bunch of writing and one day disappeared and I called the police for a health and welfare check. That's how we became friends. Um, and we're very close now, we talk every day. Um, but he disappeared, like he said everything in such a way that like it was like 401 gone. Like he didn't just said it like gone, he said it like 401. And I'm like, well, the guy's gonna kill himself. And he wasn't, but um he's come back he's he works under a different name now and he works on a different set of things and he's pretty popular um but one of his favorite lines that he likes to say to me was i had twenty-five thousand followers and no friends 
and he perceived that there was a division between a person who was ambiently connected to you via an algorithm and a true friend. And he found it very, now he was a, he was a, um, he was a recovered um, heroin addict. So he had had a lot of time to assess what gets him in, what got him in places in life and how to avoid falling into pits. So he had and has a hyperactive awareness of the links and lack of links between people and falling between priorities. And I, you know, I totally get that a lot of these relationships are synthetic. And I think that there's a part of that that's always going to be a problem where on one level you say, yeah, you know, like you have a kid, he's 13 and he, he's being followed by 1400 people and he feels any sort of connection to those 1400 people who may be half of them may be algorithms. And yet, you know, being forced into these positions of talking for hours on end to an empty machine um, to perceive some sort of advantage. Um, I see parallels in what people did when they would like go to bars or attend events or go to things or churches and other things where they too, if they didn't, they could be there, but they weren't really there where they're, they're attending because they're supposed to. And they, and for them, it's synthetic. Like they just went to the bar and sat there and talked randomly to people about nothing. And most of them wouldn't remember their name if they disappeared for a week. So I think there's always that danger with humans. Um, the computer just makes it more quantifiable in the same way that there's radio and you're broadcasting out to the world. So you're like on the thing, like, ah! but in the streaming world, you're like, there are 14 people. They are listening to you. That's a very different feeling than when you're, I would, uh, here's a shocking twist. I used to be a radio DJ. Um, you know, there's a, there's, there's a huge difference between, Hey, Boston. And hey, 12 people I can see on the little person count. Um, that, that sense of reality, um, I think is tough. Um, but I don't think any of this, some of it's more quantifiable, but I don't think any of this is new, frankly. I think this is the same problem people have always had, that they can fall very hap happily into a, a simulacrum of a life. Um, simply by what drives them and their personality and, and so on. I, don't, I think it's a danger in any situation. And it's one of the reasons why I tend to phone people and I tend to, when I can, show up to stuff as a person, as this flamboyant kind of figure. Um, I just went to a vintage computer festival over the last weekend and somebody mailed me and I found out that he wanted to meet me. And I was there for about two hours and he was trying to build himself up to make the leap to talk to me and he couldn't do it. It just was too much. And he was like, I didn't want to bother you. And I'm like, why would I dress like a drunk ringmaster and then walk around booths for two hours if I didn't want to meet people? If I don't want to meet people, I'll just go home and watch Netflix and Hulu. Like, I don't need to do anything. I chose to be there. Um, uh, please don't do that next time. And maybe next time he won't do it to somebody else who he can then connect with. So I'm very much about the humanist side of things. I think the artifacts thing is very cool, but the stories of how these tapes were done, like this was a family that owned an anime store that also had other products. Uh, and it closed and they were throwing them out and somebody on Reddit said, you should talk to Jason Scott. So I drove down to their house in New Jersey, picked them up. And ever since then, every time I put something up, they're like, yeah, we got that from this store. They were angry, whatever. And it's just like they have stories that nobody thought to ask them. That was another one of my long answers, but I thought it was a very universal question. So are there any other questions or have we gone way over time? <laughs> we're going over, but if you want to entertain another question. Sure. If somebody has one, you know, they want to talk about, I'm happy to do it. I'll jump in if no one else is, is waiting. Uh, I've enjoyed your stories and I, you're, you, you seem most passionate about the human side. So I feel a little bit bad about asking something that's a little more technical. 
I, that's the best way to do it is to go like, oh, you're really worried about the sense that people have that they're adrift. But I want to know this. Did X modem start with a CRC or was that added later? By the way, the answer is initially X modem had no CRC and other people came to Ward and convinced him to add a CRC. Um, and he chose um, the blocks to be 128 bytes because that was the size of the disk of the S100 machine he was working with. If you want another stupid one, MUDs use port 4201. And I always was like, well, that must be some important Unix consideration and whatever else. And I met Jim Asness, who designed Tiny Mud, and said, why did you choose port 4201? And he was like, that was my dorm number. So yeah, sometimes you find out at the bottom. Anyway, go ahead. That's, that's cool. Um, I, I was thinking about the the curation and indexing challenge that, that you have, it, um, it's kind of overwhelming as an occasional visitor. Is there anything interesting going on in that space, the innovative approaches or way? I mean, it's only getting worse as you get more and more data. So I mean, sure. there must be huge possibilities for uh, you know, speech to text to better index things or to somehow let someone identify their point of view and then have a, a an appropriately tailored filter bubble for them uh, is anything interesting going on in this space yeah i assume you mean i assume you mean the internet archive not textfiles.com yeah um, that's what i'm thinking so so yeah um so uh no it's it's a nightmare um the the internet archive like i said gets between five and seven thousand regular items and actually we're getting a lot um of other data we soft launched it. Here's a here's a good one. Here's a good insider one for you. Are you ready for this? Um, we bought a warehouse of microfilm a couple of years ago, and we've been digitizing it, and we've been putting it up on the Internet Archive at the rate currently, no joke, of about 1.5 million pages a day, and they are periodicals. So we are putting up. I swear to God hundreds of thousands of issues of periodicals and when they when they slam into place it'll be like um 17 magazine for girls from 1947 to 2005 boom the entire run uh digitized that, that it is such a, a a stunning mass of information that we're doing right now pulling this in and and, and like that's one of the projects that doesn't even count like the here's a here's a number for you um every day we archive you know either revisiting or for the first time uh one billion urls like how do you even process those numbers right how do you process um an average of you know um you know several thousand audio items or hundreds you know all these things coming in and 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 um the answer is um you don't. What I have been working on for years is a system where I sort some of them into very arbitrary collections and nobody's getting in the... Oh, Robert's asking. Yes, Robert. Yes. Um, so uh, I guess you weren't there for the opening. The opening is if a very, 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 very rich man has spent 25 years and millions of dollars of his fortune to build a, a mass a bunch of data, do you think he's got something running on the side? Yes, yes, he does, but he doesn't talk about it, and it is—it is not in America. Um, so, uh, in terms of like this material, I started building arbitrary collections, magazines. Uh, um, what are some of the other things I've done? Full-length movies, television, and then making sub-collections, uh, CD-ROMs. We have tens of thousands of CD-ROMs, shareware CD-ROMs. That's a personal interest of mine. But all of these collections are relatively arbitrary. There was a professional archivist who wrote an, arc, uh, an article about the Internet Archive. And what they basically said was the future of the Internet Archive is it's going to be a subfolder on somebody's disk in 50 years. And I'm like, yeah, probably. I mean, I strongly, I would rather the situation we have right now while we can afford it of acquiring as much of this ambient data as possible than a situation where we set up fully sortable, perfect 
lineage and we get 150 uploads a day. Um, there'll be high quality uploads, but all this other material, I will wander in there and nobody knows what they're doing. A lot of people don't know what they're doing. And I'll look at it and I'll be like, wow, you didn't know what you're doing, but wow. Like um, trying to think of one that I did recently that isn't weird. Um, you know, oh, uh, there's a couple, um, there's like, I think it's like 1,500 North Korean karaoke videos. Like that's interesting. Nobody was asking for that. Nobody was sitting on the list going like, where are we on those? Where, where, where's the DPRK's music background? Where's their catalog? Somebody went ahead and they got their hands on a DPRK karaoke set, disassembled it, ripped everything on the thing. And, and these songs are great because they're all like Chinese songs rewritten with the North Korean lyrics. And the, the videos are like as generic as you can imagine. It's just like people walking down a street and it's fascinating, but nobody was asking for this thing. So, okay, we've got it. Um, I'll give you a good example of one that I pushed for that was a huge success and is an example. Um, and I guess I'll leave it at that. I'll, I'll, I'll rest my case on that. Um, there was a dude, he worked at a Kmart. This is like 1988 through like 95. He worked at a Kmart and Kmart at the time had attention Kmart shoppers, the uh, audio that played. And it came on a cassette tape that was mailed once a week and you'd plug it in, let it run for one week on loop and then throw out the tape. Except he didn't throw out the tapes, put it into his apron, went home. So he had hundreds of these things. And so he decided to digitize them, put them on YouTube, immediate copyright strikes, gone. Uh, their auto system is like, this sounds way too much like uh, My Way by Frank Sinatra being done by a crappy string band. Um, so we took them and we have them up in a collection called Attention Kmart Shoppers. And so there's like hundreds upon hundreds of these things. And Brewster, you know, he's Mr. Book Guy, my boss, sorry, the, the founder. He's like, you know, Mr. Book Guy. I'm like, yeah, but listen to me. Kmart audio tapes with built-in announcements about credit cards, dentistry, and taking care of your kids. And he's like, okay, I guess. Suddenly hits NPR, hits all of these newspapers, massive thing. A, 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 a chill beats DJ in Texas creates an album called Attention Kmart Choppers, which is like a remixed version of the whole thing, which is really something to listen to. Comes out on, comes out on a limited edition vinyl, mails that to uh, the guy who uploaded the tapes. That's fascinating. However, a kid, and I mean, he is a kid. He was like 19 and he may be in his 20s now. Got his hands. So before Kmart was Kmart, it was Kresge Mart, S.S. Kresge uh, in the 60s. Um, before it got refashioned to K-Bart. And so S.S. Kresge, uh, believe it or not, S. Uh, Kresge was an upscale department store. And so they had training film strips and vinyl records. You would play with the film strips, talking about loss and prevention, making your station night, how to treat a customer. And this kid digitized all the film strips digitized all the vinyl, uploaded them to us, and then made MP4s where he played the vinyl while turning the images. So you could actually just experience the film. And then he found training manuals for the SS Kresge Corporation, and they're all sitting together. At the end of that is the realization that nobody asked for this that there was no mandate, there was no anything. The kid, the, 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 the kid, the DJ, the Kmart guy, me, none of us knew each other. And then, you know, two, three years later, it's this incredible body of work on the Internet Archive that has been viewed. Uh, last I checked, I should just check again. Um, attention, Kmart, uh, archive.org. All right, and um, there we go. So according to the uh, statistics, 2.6 million views in the last few years. So obviously of great import, nobody knew they wanted this. I rest my case. Um, I guess we'll leave it at that. Um, 
I will say to people here, um, Jason at textfiles.com, feel free to mail me if you have more complicated questions um, or not complicated questions. I'm more than happy to work on them. Sometimes I'm a very fast responder, sometimes I'm not. Um, the easiest way to have me not respond fast is if you ask me to write a thesis. Um, if you're like, what are your thoughts on what represents true ephemerality? It's gonna be a week. Jason, why doesn't this work? That gets my response immediately or, or gets you to the right people. Or Jason, I'm sitting on top, I get these all the time. Jason, I'm sitting on top of 600 videotapes. What do you do? And, uh, and we do it. So there you go. Thank so you. Jason, I know something about SS Kresge. Uh, I wouldn't call them a, a high-end department store. There, there was actually a uh, five, at what's called a five and dime or a dime store. Neighbor, to, neighborhood store uh, to the but, to the world of the present day a five and dime looks like luxury that's okay, part of it that, yeah. that's, i think that's just i think if you look at the photos um to me again i'm 50 uh they look like the epitome of class you know as somebody who like wanders through a dollar general uh trying to buy toilet paper fast Kresge looks like I just walked into a, 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 you know, an upscale restaurant and ordered the Wellington. So that's part of it too. It's like, I'll, it's, I'll give you that. Yes. It's classier than a dollar store. Yeah. Was well, that your, I, that was your comment? Was you, you're, you're, you're overselling the Kresge corporation? No, no, no. Uh, I live near Detroit and the headquarters of SS Kresge was uh, in the Northern Detroit suburb. So it's uh a childhood uh, memory. Yeah. The crazy store. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, the, the, you know, um, Kresge, Kresge, SS Kresge dates back to 1912. I just found out. So it's, it's yeah. got some, it's got some history behind it. Um, this, by the way, is my life. People from a Linux group asked me to come in and speak. And at the end, we are mulling over the lifespan of a department store. Uh, that listed for a hundred years, but that's the way I work. So I have a question for you, Dad. Are you familiar with the BBS uh, called Confer? When you say now, you mean actual dial-up BBS? Uh, yeah, three hundred uh, baud or whatever. Oh, um, at the time, I don't know. not necessarily. Like I don't, okay. I don't really track things like that. But it, it was it C O N F E R or C O N. Right. It was developed at the University of Michigan, and I would, uh, I was really a lurker there. I didn't have anything to contribute, but uh, back in the eighties, I guess nineteen eighties, something like that. Yeah. Um, no, I'm, I'm a. Uh... I, I believe that I witnessed the birth of the emoji on that BBS because I saw a conversation explaining that people get things wrong. And I wish I could confirm this, but it's my memory that among the university people who were actually conversing on this medium, uh, there was a comment that the, uh, when you have only text without seeing someone's face, things can get terribly misunderstood. And so you need something sometimes to say, hey, I'm, I don't mean anything bad by what I just said. You know, you need a, another dimension besides just th the text itself. Right. And so they said, if you have a colon closed, closed parent, uh, looks like a sideways smile, smiley face, uh, that would be a good thing because uh, you could say, you know, no, no. Nah, you know, don't take this the wrong way. So I, right. it, to me, that was the the um, the beginning of what has become a plague of of <laughs> unnecessary emojis. But uh, well, I mean, but, if you if you go ahead and look, you look at the historical artifacts. Uh, so so I'll I'll give an endorsement here. Um, there is a writer. His name is Tom Standage. S T A N D. Uh, A-G-E, Tom Standage. And Tom Standage has written four or five books. I actually interviewed him for a documentary I didn't do, just mostly to meet Tom Standage, because so, he's from, he's from um, 
he's from the UK. Um, but he wrote a book called The Victorian Internet, and it's about the telegraph. Uh, he also wrote one called The History of the World in Six Classes, where he uses six different drinks to demonstrate human civilization and so on. Uh, he wrote one on, on um, the, uh, the Mechanical Turk um, on the, the chess playing machine. And all of them are incredibly deep because they show that many of the concepts and ideas that we were trying to pursue uh, were, were extant over and over again for years until they caught fire or ended up finding a new home. So for instance, in, um, <laughs> in telegraphs, he, he gives an example that they charged by the word. So people would create these systems of words where every letter represented like a to z represented a fact so they created these heavily compressed like lz mmr5 means order 35 bushels from this division and ship it to here and then just get charged for one word and it worked well except for one or two cases where um instead of M, it would come off as, you know, another letter. And suddenly instead of 35 bushels, it would be um, 3,500 bushels. And then they would have a lot of trouble. So that's, that was them begging for a CRC check in 1917. Um, so that was like, an, you know, the idea that they were building basically zip compressed dictionary structure in the early 1900s to save money for telegraphs was mind blowing to me. And all of his books are built this way. So that I, I recommend all of them. They're, they're incredible. Like the, the 350 year history of the Mechanical Turk chess playing machine is astounding. Um, and there's, there's like so much history that's out there and all of it having some amount of relevance today to understand that things have been this way for some time. <laughs> Well, I guess that pretty much wraps it up for questions. Uh, it, Jason, it was delightful to have you. It was absolutely fantastic. No problem. And um, everyone should go watch the VBBS documentary. I, I rewatched it when I booked Jason. <laughs> um, yeah. And uh, uh, everyone unmutes and gives him a round of applause, I think. Yeah, thank you very much. It's fascinating. Yeah, uh, no problem.